All right, I have two o'clock, so I think I'm going to get started here. And um, really, what the purpose of this webinar is, and I think we this was brought up on the last one that we did last month, is generally what we've done is we've kind of structured out the year for our webinars, and we're going kind of industry general knowledge um, with a, a topic, and then following that up with a product that's related to that general topic with the next webinar, and then back to industry knowledge and then product related. So today is an industry knowledge kind of general information webinar. I'm not gonna give a whole lot on uh, Z-band specific stuff. There will be a slide at the end um, that talks about the product that we will be doing in the next webinar that's related to this. Um, but today, these are just general knowledge sessions. And the reason that we're doing this is um, <laughs> A lot of times, some of these things get we get asked questions about these things as Z band, or I'll have conversations with customers, and uh, certain information will get conflated or will be slightly misinterpreted. So, we do like to make sure, and there's a couple I'll point them out as we're going through a couple of things that we wanted to, to talk about. So, today we're going to talk about HEVC, you know, uh, uh, or H.265 as it's known, and SRT. And I confused my marketing guy a little bit on this one. Um, when we're talking about SRT here, we are talking about high vision, secure, reliable transport. Well, well high vision was the, the creator. Now it's been far more broadly adopted, but we're talking about secure, reliable transport, um, not SRT as it comes to closed captioning. I did confuse my marketing guy with that a little bit. So this is definitely, this is compression and transport protocol. This is, uh, you know, IP video introductory course here. Um, so we're going to start with HEVC because it's first alphabetically I, uh, and because when I was kind of building the webinar, it made sense to tell you how video is actually created and composed first and then how it's transported versus telling you how it's transported and then, <laughs> you know, then telling you how we, we got it to the point where we could transport it anyway. Um, so HEVC is high efficiency video coding, like I said before, also known as H.265. And it's the successor to H.264, which was the successor to MPEG-2. Um, and it's really just the latest in a line of, of developments that's been going on since the mid-2000s, let's say, of trying to more efficiently de describe video to get it into a smaller space. Um, and I hit on it a little bit in the, uh, later in the webinar and some of the, the PowerPoint bullets. But really, the reason that we're trying to do this is just bandwidth consumption and data consumption, right? Television service providers are trying to compress, and cellular service providers are trying to compress the amount of uh, space that we're taking up with TV and video, because a lot of the estimates that are out there um, are that 70 to 80 percent of the data uh, bandwidth that's consumed by users um, by 2027, 2028 is is going to be video. You think TikTok, assuming we don't ban it and decide that it's not allowed in the U.S. anymore. Um, Instagram, Facebook, like all of those autoplay videos and everything that you have, so much of the content that we are consuming now as end users, both at the commercial and the consumer level, is video-based content. And so there's this problem, um, which we'll describe here in the next slide, of like, okay, we have all of this video-based content. It's so much of our bandwidth. How do we reduce that, right? How do we make a better use, better allocation of the frequencies that we have available tr for transporting video? Um, one of the things with HEVC, um, and this stretches back to, oh man, I can't tell you how many customers I've had over the years kind of make this confusion, um, is HEVC is a compression algorithm. It describes, what it does is it describes video in motion and spatial change and color change and all those those types of, of compressions regardless of the resolution uh, we have clients who want to associate hevc with 4k and kind of the genesis of that is it does <laughs> it compresses 4k very significantly and makes it easier for us to distribute 4k video on this mass scale um, but it's not specific to 4K. And this is a confusion thing that I just want to make sure I address early in the, the webinar here. I can take a 480 video or a 360p video or whatever. And if I want to HEVC compress that thing and send it out the other side, absolutely, I can do that. There's nothing in HEVC itself or anything that you, you're doing on the compression side of things that is specific to any video resolution. Uh, but we do have 
clients and in some of the folks that we run across in the industry kind of use these terms interchangeably. Oh, it's 4K, it's HEVC. Those are not the same thing. Um, 4K is a resolution that is describing the quality of the video and the number of pixels that are actually on the screen. HEVC is how we're compressing that video. And I understand like why the two are associated, but I do want to make sure we're really clear up front that these are not the same um, because that is confusion that we get into. So and what we're getting into what we're doing from a, a HEVC standpoint and compressing video. Well, the question is, why do we need to compress video, right? Like, what, where did this come from in the first place? This is a, a new thing um, in terms of, well, relatively new thing in, in terms of the AV industry. And you have a couple of basic problems. Um, what a video is, this is really reductive, and I apologize in advance for it, um, is it's just a series of still images, right? When you're sending video out at 60 frames per second, that's just 60 still images per second that are displaying on the TV screen. The issue that you have there is that's a lot of bandwidth, right? You second bullet here, uh, a, a 1080 frame at, at 60 hertz, that's 1.87 gig uncompressed of data over the network backbone. Well, that's not great because, you know, I mean, we have some clients now that are putting in 40 gig backbones and 100 gig backbones. But we also have a lot of clients that are 10 gig backbone um, in terms of their, their data throughput. And so now I can only put four or five TV channels on my network and then my entire network has crashed and, and useless. So that's problematic. Um, it gets even more problematic as we're getting into traditional RF video and cable TV distribution because a QAM channel only handles 38.8 megabits per second of data, which is a lot of digital programming when it's compressed, but obviously absolutely no digital programming whatsoever when it's uncompressed video. So the core issue that we have is that we create this beautiful content, but it's gigs and gigs and gigs of data, and we have to be able to move it from point A to point B. We have to be able to move it from the broadcaster out to the service providers, the service providers have to be able to move it to their clients, and their clients have to be able to move it around uh, within their networks and their infrastructures, whether those are coax infrastructures, whether they're IP-based infrastructures, or whether they're some hybrid of the two. Um, so that's the reason that we have to compress this video is because we have to take these massive gigabit upon gigabit files of raw video data or a series of raw images, which is you know what it actually is, and squeeze it down into a 38.8 meg pipe so that we can distribute it across the TV network if we want to distribute um, you know, 4K video over your, your coax plant. So that's the, the why of things. Why are we compressing video? The next part of it is how are we actually doing this? Um, so what HEVC actually does is, let's go back to that picture concept. We're taking an image, a picture, a one of those 60 frames throughout your 60 frames per second, and the codec is capturing all of that. Colors, um, any sort of motion vectors that it can, can capture. Really, it's just taking that entire thing and describing it, and it's setting that as a, a frame, that, that's a reference frame. And then it's gonna take a look at another frame, and you can adjust this, it's called a group of picture or GOP structure, um, how far forward in terms of the pictures that it looks at. Let's say it, it skips 15 pictures forward and says, okay, I'm gonna take a look at this one now. Um, so you take your base picture and you take your, your picture that's 15 frames forward in the video, and it looks at the two of them and it compares them. It says, okay, what's different? Uh, the colors changed here. We've moved three feet to the right on this or you know, seven pixel units to the right, however you want to do that. And then all a compression algorithm is doing at, at, at its most fundamental is filling in the blank for those 14 frames in between your first picture and the one that's 15 down the line. It says, well, if this baseball player moved from right field to right center, obviously he, he did some running. <laughs> he moved a little bit. Um, if the baseball, uh, I'm in the Orioles mode right now because we're starting off decent. So, hey, it's, it's, all my references are going to be baseball today. Uh, and starting off decent is a rare thing for us, so I'm going to celebrate it while it's happening. Um, you know, if, if the baseball moved from Grayson Rodriguez's hand to midway down towards the batter's box, we have to assume that it took this path. Like, this is the most likely path that it took. 
And so what compression algorithms are doing, and HEBC is the best at it in terms of the ones on the market right now, is it's just interpolating all of that data. And then it's describing, hey, this is the direction that we think everything moved. This is you know, kind of the path that everything took to get there, to get in between these, you know, these two reference frames. And so this is what the video looked like for all these 14 frames in the middle. And then it's going to break that down and focus on the areas with high differentiation. So what this actually looks like um, when you're looking at HEVC is the thing that it does differently, significantly differently than MPEG-2 and H.264 before it is this ability to focus on areas of motion uh, like the top of the head here where we have these coding tree units of multiple kind of different colors that are going on to dive into. There's a couple of really small ones that are in here, um, you know, in, in and around the sand on the ground. There's a couple of small ones that are broken up. Um, a few really small ones kind of here in the corner. We get some differentiation of color between um, and another small set here uh, where we have a bunch of differentiation of color and shading in the horse rider. Um, in MPEG-2 and in H.264, uh, what was going on bef before is it just kind of broke everything up into equal parts and said, okay, we're going to describe all the parts equally and we're going to spend the same amount of processing power and the same amount of computing power describing all the parts. Um, HEVC does not do that. HEVC focuses in on these areas where we actually have to have some differentiation, right? It's it, it's spending the algorithmic power and the processing power on the stuff that matters. So you end up with a much cleaner description um, from frame to frame to frame of what's actually happening in the video than you did with pre previous algorithms be because HEVC is intelligent enough to kind of go in and break up these coding tree units. I'm going to go back one slide here just to pull that up. And so what you were actually seeing is the big ones are those 64 by 64 pixel units, and then all the way down to some of these little eight by eight pixel sets that you see like in the corner up here, where we've got, again, a couple of different colors and some different motion going in and out. And the same thing here around this person's head. Um, that's the, the breakup of the coding tree units that the algorithm is actually doing in order to accurately describe this video. And well, why does this matter? This matters, again, because of what we were talking about earlier, where the more accurately I can describe this video, kind of what we're searching for, right, is this holy grail of being able to compress video down and make it as small as we can possibly make it without actually losing the quality in the video. Where with MPEG-2 and with H.264, if I'm just taking like a 16 by 16 coding tree unit or a, a 32 by 32 coding tree unit and saying, okay, this one's gray and it's moving to the right. Well, I'm going to lose some detail in there because that's not actually what was happening for that entire CTU. Um, so with MPEG-2 and H.264, you lost some, some video quality. And what HEVC is attempting to do is minimize that loss of video quality kind of as we're compressing data down and as we're dropping down in bandwidth. And there's a couple of different applications for that, um, which we're already kind of covering on this stream here. Uh, but really the big applications for that are I can take a 1080 video and where before with H.264, it was, let's call it 10 megabits per second just to make the, the math easy. Now I can take that same 1080 video and I can drop it down to five megabits per second for video transmission and I can get the exact same quality out of it. You know, it's going to look the same, possibly even better, through that HEVC at half the bandwidth. So if I'm the military sending stuff point to point, or if I'm you know, trying to broadcast some sort of live event out over the, the internet or back to uh, like a, a TV station to ingest it so that it can then be rebroadcast out to all of our partners, I'm going to save a bunch of bandwidth, with which I have to rent if I'm doing over the internet streaming, so it's going to save me money. Or the other option for that is I can keep my same bandwidth, and now I've got much better video quality. So that 1080 stream is getting far better described and is a far truer replication to the actual still images than what it would be with MPEG-2 or H.264. So really what HEVC is doing for us as end users is 
the picture on the screen is a lot prettier. And then for the, the network side of things, we're using less bandwidth to get you that pretty picture. Um, so, and, and this is a continuing thing, right? Like there's H.266 is in the works, and I think there's a couple of products that are out on the market for it now, even though there's not a lot of wide adoption. And it's this, this kind of arms race. It's a weird way to describe it, but it's kind of what it is. Uh, between increasing video resolutions, you know, we got 18K and, or 8K and 16K and, and moving up in terms of the quality of the video resolution and our ability to accurately describe and transport these media. And really, that's <laughs> one of the cruxes of the industry in terms of, you know, 8K and 16K getting into the house or, or being widely distributed is like, well, how do we compress that into usable data um, without actually losing the the video quality um, that makes it 8k or 16k and they're probably so, the, the folks that i see on the webinar today are a wide range from designers and architects to end users and kind of everything in between i would guess that there's at least one of you on the call that's a straight up video purist that says as soon as you compress 4k video it's no longer 4k you can put it back together on the other end as an approximation of 4K, but as soon as as soon as you compress it, it's not 4K anymore, right? Because you're losing, you're you're compressing some of those pixels together and describing them uh, differently than what they were originally created. And that same concept applies as we move forward to 8K and 16K. So as you see these greater resolutions and these prettier pictures, when we go out to to NAB and to Infocom and these trade shows uh, in the audiovisual industry. The compression algorithms behind the scenes have to be able to keep up in order for us to accurately be able to move this video around. Um, and HEVC does that really, really well. And it's it was definitely a big breakthrough in terms of how video is described and what we're doing from the compression side of things. Um, so what's the catch, right? <laughs> is is the question. You know, if it's better and it does everything really well, like why do I not have all the channels in my house 4K right now? Um, and really the big issue or one of the big issues is, um, it's just not, it's, it's, it's not a standard, uh, in a lot of the consumer grade devices that, that we utilize on a day-to-day -day basis and kind of drive this market a little bit more than the commercial market does. Um, and it, it, the greatest, uh, example of that is like AGVC is not standard in a, a Windows machine, like Windows media players and that kind of stuff. That's not standard to pick up AGVC H.265. You have to download a plugin or go grab VLC or something like that off the, the market in order to be able to actually pull H.265. The other thing that happened, it, it, and it's kind of unfortunate timing, at least from a consumer standpoint, from the broadcaster standpoint in normal course of business, is we went through this big digital transition in the early 2000s, right? And we can just, we can quibble, I guess, about what, how exactly you want to define the early 2000s or whether or not we're even done with the digital transition because I think there's probably at least one of the customers that's on the line right now that still has some analog channels that they're pushing around. Uh, but it was this massive expense to get to SDI broadcasting or to get to you know, full digital 1080 broadcasting from the previous kind of analog modulator demodular platforms that a lot of um, broadcasters and, and service providers had. So there was a boatload of money that was put into the broadcast industry in the early 2000s, again, broadly defined, um, in order to do this analog to digital transition. And then we come along 10 years later and say, hey, congratulations, like all that stuff that you just put in for MPEG-2 or H.264, it's not cutting edge anymore. Here's this thing that's twice as good. Oh, by the way, you know, this stuff is going to cost you some money again. And the broadcasters are going, well, well, why? Right? Why am I going to do this right now when a lot of the end user devices, uh, you know, don't natively support HEVC? There's not a ton of 4K created content, content, at least here in the US, that's being distributed uh, from the service provider, you know, from the, the actual content creators to the service providers. So there's been a little bit of a slow adoption in terms of actually creating that content and pushing it to the home. And because it's not being pushed, then there's no real demand on the consumer side either. 
right? Like, I don't know of anyone that's ever come up to me and like, oh man, I can't believe I don't have an HEBC codec in my Roku box. Um, because frankly, for most of what we do in terms of at-home streaming, 1080p streaming, 720 streaming, H.264 is fine. And it's the standard. And th that's the other thing that we'll, we'll get into when we start to talk about SRT is there were other standards and other successful streaming media prior to HEBC. So even though it's kind of the latest and greatest, and it definitely does the best job in describing video, its core issue, at least from where I sit, in terms of why there's not wider adoption and why we don't have AGBC encoders and decoders everywhere, is there's a cost factor to it. And then there is also the issue of there's no real problem for it to solve in the general consumer market. Um, much different in, in the kind of commercial market where we're doing more point to point and like WAN streaming and some of that kind of stuff. But in the general consumer market, there's nothing actually driving right now that push from H.264 to H.265 that's catastrophic. So it, ha it has kind of kept the implementation of this behind the scenes a little bit more limited than what you would have expected from what's a significantly better technology in terms of the compression side of things. Um, so that's my, my little spiel on <laughs> HEVC. And what we're going to do next is take a look at, um, now that we've created and compressed this video, so we have it to the point where, hey, we're ready to transport this, how am I going to send it? where I need to send it. And that's where SRT and secure reliable transport come in. Um, and again, where we see this with clients, and I was actually out with a customer in Baton Rouge the other week, and they're taking a chapel channel that they create in their main hospital, and they're broadcasting it throughout that hospital. And now they also have this application where they wanna send this across their wide area network to a bunch of different hospitals that they own throughout the, the greater Baton Rouge area. Um, and the hospital that's across the street from the main hospital, we pushed it, uh, go next door. Everything looks great. You go 25 miles down the road, uh, connected via the WAN and you're just getting a little bit of packet loss, a little bit of pixelization. And so every 10 or 15 seconds, you get frame jumps, you get little judder, uh, jitters in the video, that kind of stuff. Um, and that's packet loss. And it's packet loss because video is sensitive to those types of things, especially UDP video, multicast video. Uh, it's very sensitive to, to packet loss. And so there's been two ways that we've kind of overcome this in the past. Uh, number one is to not use UDP content um, and use something that's more TCP related. So it's a lot more like internet browsing, where if the packet gets dropped, the end device goes, hey, I missed some video there. Can you resend it to me? Transmit side says, yeah, sure, that's great. Let me fire that back over to you. Um, but that introduces a bunch of latency, right? Because every time we do that, hey, I dropped some packets on the receive side of things, we have to stop and wait for those packets to come and then start playing the video again. You see this all the time at home when you're doing streaming, like that's what buffering is, right? Buffering is just that's the error correction of, oh crap, I missed some packets. I need to go back and get them. So every time you start something on Netflix and you get the little spinning percentage bar that goes one, two, five, seven, 48, 92, um, that's Netflix talking back to the server that's actually creating the content and auto negotiating what your bandwidth is, what your bit rate is. And then family starts to come home, homework's being done. You're also like watching YouTube on your phone while you're watching Netflix on the TV because we all have 30 second long attention spans these days. And the, the TV will actually renegotiate what's going on and you'll see a change in video quality, right? Um, as the utilization of your network changes, so does the, the change in video quality. This whole process is called adaptive bitrate streaming. Um, and it works great. You don't miss anything. Everything kind of pops in. You can pause, play, rewind. The problem is for live events, it's very slow, right? Because we're constantly doing that act and renegotiation of packets. And so you can get in excess of 30 seconds of latency with uh, some of those streaming mechanisms. A great way to test this, a way to do it, is if you're a cord cutter, um, 
throw that OTA antenna up on your roof, pick up your local ABC, NBC station, watch it directly through the antenna, and then flip over to Hulu or YouTube Live or DirecTV Streaming or whatever it is and watch that exact same station, you're going to be 20 to 30 seconds behind on your streaming service versus what you are when you're just pulling the antenna off the roof. And that might be generous depending on how good or bad your, your network is. Um, so that's kind of the, the real-time application for SRT, not so much in, in broadcast distribution because of what we just talked about, um, but more so in, I don't want to broadcast a live event that's 30 seconds behind everything else. You know, there's a lot of times, let's like, like look at military applications or stuff like that, that 30 seconds is quite potentially life and death, right? Um, the other way that we transport video now is if we're not doing TCP video where there's some forward error correction, well, then there's no forward error correction and we're just doing a straight UDP broadcast which is fantastic as long as the network is supporting and ready to you know throw through that live video but a lot of times that's a very specific network configuration right is there dscp tagging involved is do we need to have quality of service turned on a lot of that kind of stuff happens um with just a straight udp broadcast and like i said when i was talking with that customer in baton rouge those systems are very very sensitive so what you actually end up with is even 1% of packet loss can completely destroy the video quality that you're looking at when we're talking about UDP broadcasts. So what SRT does, Secure Reliable Transport does, is it kind of bridges the gap between these two concepts of TCP for that forward error correction and retransmission of packets and UDP broadcast for making things fast. Um, and really, this was it was it's an excellent technology for, for that side of things. And then I missed I, I saw the bullet on the last slide. I forgot to talk about it. The other thing that we're doing here is the S in SRT, Secure Reliable Transport, is security. So this is AES encrypted content. So if it is government content or protected corporate content or you know, legal content, whatever that would happen to be. Let's say it's coming from a courtroom, since that's a recent example from news everybody's been watching. Um, you are able to protect this content so that it can't be picked up midstream, right? AES 128-bit and 256-bit encryptions are basically the U.S. government standard for encryption. So that AES is, is widely accepted um, within not only the AV industry, but other industries as well. Um, and so what you end up getting from this SRT side of things is now I've compressed my content using HEVC or H.264, and now I can transport it, and I can transport it securely, and I can transport it quickly, and I can transport it over the internet, and I can do that and be really confident in the video quality that I'm going to get out on the other side. And that's really the jump that SRT made, is you were kind of picking some of those things. You could transmit it, and you could transmit it securely, and you could transmit it with great video on the other side, but it wasn't necessarily going to be quick. Or you could transmit it, and you could transmit it securely, and you could transmit it quickly, but we weren't going to make any guarantees on video quality, because if your network had a bunch of packet loss, then... Eh, this you know, we, you'll get it there and you'll get it there fast, but we're not sure how it's going to look. Um, so SRT kind of jumps through and bridges the gap to allow this like quick, high quality video to be pushed across lossy networks like WANs and the internet. And the initial playback setup is actually really cool. So the SRT devices, and we have some stuff in our office for testing purposes, obviously, and then for the encoder that, that we'll talk about in, in the next webinar. Um, when I set them up, I set up the encoder at our office in Carlisle, and then I live in Hagerstown, Maryland. And you, know, you set up the, the encoder in its, you know, its caller mode, right? Like it's, it's reaching out saying, hey, here I am. I'm broadcasting these packets. I have things I want to send you. And the decoder is in listener mode. And it's like, okay, cool. I hear your packets. I'm going to send you some too because, you know, we want to try and get a feel for what this connection is, right? How long does it take to ping back and forth? What's the packet loss look like? Is there any jitter? What other uh, network issues do I have? 
And my experiences with it personally is it took about 10 or 15 seconds for this auto negotiation between these two devices to take place from Carlisle to Hagerstown, which is 70 miles, give or take, um, you know, depending on how the, the crow is flying that day. Definitely not if he's following the southwesternly road through central Pennsylvania. Um, so what you get is that, okay, I'm going to send these packets. We're going to negotiate this link. The receiver sends their packets and negotiate the link. After both the transmit and receive device or the caller and the listener have sent their packets and that negotiation is taking place and that handshakes takes place, then the SRT encoder uh, is going to start sending its video. So what I was actually able to do, this is probably six or eight months ago now when we were doing some of our initial testing and initial validation, is broadcast that out from Carlisle and I was able to watch a full 1080 quality action movie you know, sitting at my desk at my uh, my home office here in Hagerstown um, without any further interruptions. Like after it initially negotiated that link for, for 15, 20 seconds, that was it. it. It looked really smooth. After that, the audio comes through, everything comes through. I didn't put it in here as a bullet, but there is an audio and video sync capability to SRT as well. So you shouldn't get audio and video drift like you can sometimes. Um, but it's really very impressive stuff from a technology standpoint. And what you end up with when you combine these two things together is what we're going to talk about in the next webinar, which is we now have this ability for any of your point to point streaming applications to send a high quality, low bandwidth stream with error correction technology, with encryption out of one device. Um, and it's really an excellent piece of technology that we're happy to be bringing to you know, our little corner of the world. Um, but then also just kind of jumping in and being on trend here with the rest of the industry where we're talking about you know, secure, reliable transport, HEVC, kind of latest generation technologies that we're, in my opinion, are going to be talking about more and more over the coming years as these things kind of get out of their adoption stage and into being more broadly applicable within the consumer market. So that was what I wanted to overview today. That was kind of what I wanted to take a look at is AGVC as a compression and kind of you know content creation tool that actually is going to describe the video and then SRT on that transport layer that's actually going to help you get it from point to point and not lose that quality uh, with AGVC. The combination of the two right now is about as good as you're going to get with wanting to take 1080 video or 4K video and compress it and push it over lossy networks. If you, when you combine these two things, HEVC and SRT, it is kind of the top of the line right now in terms of point to point streaming, uh, doing it securely and reliably. So I hope that I informed you a, a little bit today and I hope you guys come back here. I believe it's at the end of the month when I actually go through the setup of some SRT stuff with our 4K encoder and um, do a, a little demo of our latest and greatest. Um, so I will be quiet here for a little bit and just kind of wait on any questions, comments um, that go into the q and A. If we don't get any in a minute or two, we will uh, call the webinar and hopefully see you in a few weeks.